Thanks very much, uh, Sebastian, for this uh, warm introduction. And it's really a pleasure uh, uh, to be here in Colt, which has really a different flavor from uh, most uh, machine learning uh, conferences. And uh, it's a very good flavor to be here. So uh, I'll be indeed speaking about uh, deep networks. But here, that will be in the context of uh, unsupervised learning. So it's a joint work with a number of co-authors, Thomas Anglès, Joan Bruna, who is uh, at NYU, and Sixin Zhang, who also was at uh, École Normale Supérieure. So the problem we'll be looking at uh, here is the problem of unsupervised learning, so which you all know well, which has been uh, mentioned uh, this morning. So the whole problem is to estimate the probability distribution, probability density, in high dimension. So here x belongs to Rd, where d will be a high dimensional uh, parameter. And for doing that, we have n realizations of our random vector from which uh, we want to build this estimation. So as we all know, we are facing a curse of dimensionality problem whenever doing such an estimation if the only assumption we have on the probability distribution is a local regularity property. So the on, if the only thing we know about the density is that it's a locally regular uh, density, for example, a Lipschitz function, then whatever essentially strong uh, distance norm divergence we'll be using, the error between the true density and uh, the estimated density to reach a level epsilon requires an amount of samples which grows exponentially like the dimension. So basically in high dimension, it's absolutely impossible to do such estimation. This is the well-known curse of dimensionality. Now related to that, there is a very interesting open problem since essentially 1941, which is the issue of modeling turbulence. 1941, that's the date of the first publication of uh, Kolmogorov relating the property of Navier-Stokes from uh, ensemble properties of the turbulence. And the issue since then has been trying to find appropriate stochastic models for such turbulent fluid. And the problem is still totally open. So if you think about such a problem, the problem is to try to define some a priori regularity property that we can impose on the distribution P of X so that we can break this curse of dimensionality. So that's what I'll be speaking about today. And there will be essentially two parts. The first part will be related to the classic maximum entropy approach that I will relate to uh, deep neural networks. And the second part will be much more exotic is about these deep neural network generators trying to put out the kind of mathematical problems these uh, generators are uh, raising. So deep neural networks, I suppose you all know about it, unless you've been living in Mars or whatever, because we hear that all the time, all the time. You know the kind of architecture uh, they have. Uh, basically, in the case of an image, uh, you have a cascade of operators which are linear, L1, followed by a point point-wise nonlinearity, which typically is a linear rectifier, which is taking the maximum of the value at zero. And these linear operators, they are convolutional operators. That means that a point here is calculated from these images by doing a spatial convolution over a very small neighborhood, typically three by three, five by five. But there is also a three-dimensional convolution in the sense that you also have a linear combinations across the channel of all the results of convolutions for each of these images. So you have a kind of three-dimensional operator here, but which is spatially convolutional, which gives you the output value. And like this, if you move around, you are going to build a new image. Typically, you have a subsampling which goes in so that these images are smaller, and then you build up a whole series of channels by modifying these convolutional operators. And then the nonlinearity, you cascade, and so on. And at the end, you essentially build a linear aggregation of your coefficients to get an estimation of the functions that you want to estimate. So typically, in that kind of context, all your coefficients, and you have several millions of them, 
are optimized by trying to minimize an empirical loss on, uh, from the supervised data that you have. So all these are optimized uh, super, with a supervised approach. So what's the relation with unsupervised learning? Well, people, in particular uh, the group of Matthias uh, Bedge, have been trying to use that kind of structure to build random processes. So how do they do that? They use such uh, uh, neural network that they learn, for example, on ImageNet for classification. Then they take a texture, so a realization of a stationary process. They compute from one realization of this texture all the different layers of their uh, neural net. Then for each of these layers, they compute an empirical cor uh, correlation matrix. That means that they correlate any image here for a given channel with any other image by summing their products. So it's the correlation calculated by summing spatially all the pixels of any two image for two different channels. Then, in order to synthesize a new realization of their random process, what they do is they begin from Gaussian white noise and they do a gradient descent so that the resulting image, which is here X tilled, will have a decomposition with exactly or closely the same covariance matrix. So essentially, they try to match the empirical covariance coefficient up to an error epsilon. And the results are very good. So these are images, so these are realizations of turbulence, 3D turbulence in that simulation done at Ecole Normale Supérieure of, uh, you have 100 light years here. This is a mix of helium and hydrogen. This is a 2D uh, turbulence. And these are textures of rocks and so on. And these are the synthesized images. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the number of empirical covariance coefficients they've been using, they've been using more covariance coefficient than the number of pixels. In fact, 20 times more coefficients, which is statistically extremely strange. So the question is, are they just doing some kind of recopy up to modifications of the original texture? Do they produce a random process which has a lot of entropy? How can we interpret mathematically all these kind of things? OK, let me come back to standard mathematical tools when you try to approach a problem such as modelization of a high dimensional process. The first thing typically you'll try to do is to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And for doing so, one class of particularly uh, efficient models are Markov random fields. So the idea of the Markov hypothesis consists in observing that for some random processes, the knowledge of x given all at a point u given all other uh, coefficient of your random process can be computed just by the conditional knowledge over a small neighborhood, which is called a clique. So if you look, for example, on a grid like that, that means that the conditional probability will only depend upon the neighbors in this grid, the neighbors in a specific sense, in the sense of translation on the grid. So this is typically what more generally you would call a graphical model where the graph here is defined by the translation on your grid. Now this doesn't work typically for processes such as turbulence because if you look locally you are missing all the global interactions that you have in a random process so essentially that hypothesis is not valid. Okay what other approach you have? You have the approach of, that proposed by Jaynes in the 60s, which basically consists in trying to specify your high dimensional distribution from moments. So you define a family of function phi k of x, and you compute the expected value of your probability distribution, or you estimate this expected value for each of these nonlinear functions. And then the idea is to compute the probability distribution, which will satisfy these moments, and which has a maximum entropy, which is a way to express the fact that you don't have any other information about your probability distribution. Now, if you do that, if you suppose that x belongs, each value of x belongs to a bounded interval, so that you are in a compact situation, then you can prove that the minimum of this convex function, 
is going to be reached through the calculation of Lagrange multipliers. And if you write the expression of your probability distribution, you'll find the standard Gibbs energy, which essentially says that the maximization of the entropy is going to have an exponential behavior as a linear combination of each of the nonlinear function phi k of x with the normalization constant z, which is here. OK, so we have an analytical expression. And in particular, if you know that you have a Markov model, then the Harmersley Clifford theorem tells you that your probability distribution can be written that way. In fact, the phi k of x will be local potential which express the local conditional probabilities. OK, now the, the problem, as we said, is that most of the time, we won't have that kind of Markov hypothesis that will be valid. So the whole question is then, how to find these nonlinear function phi k, which will allow you to approximate your probability distribution. And the second question is, given that we are going to work with a lot, potentially, of moments, can we avoid to compute the Lagrange multipliers, because to compute the Lagrange multipliers, you need to compute a metropolis hasting algorithm. And here, if you have a very large collection of nonlinear moments, this requires an amount of time that is much too large in most practical situations. OK, so let me begin with the most difficult question, which is how to find what kind of function phi k can be appropriate to approximate your probability distribution. So what we want is to approximate, if we look at the log of uh, the probability distribution, the log is going to be a linear function of these function phi k. And what we hope is that log of p tilde is a good approximation of the log of the true probability distribution. So when you see that, immediately what appears is that what you want is to find function phi k of x, which essentially have the same regularity than log of p of x, in order to be able to regress log p of x over a few uh, such functions. So the first kind of questions that you have to ask is what kind of regularity my function p of x has. OK, the first obvious one in the case of the textures that I've been considering is that these functions are realization of stationary processes. So p of x is invariant to translation. If I translate x, p of x is not going to translate. So you would like that your function phi k of x are also invariant by translation. That's first very basic property. OK, so what people have been essentially using or using a lot in uh, turbulence uh, in statistical physics are Gaussian model. Gaussian model means that your function phi k of x is going to be a bilinear function, a product of x of u and f of x of u translated by a certain tau of k. And if you indeed use second order moments, the p, maximum entropy distribution, is going to be Gaussian. And that's what you get here. So what you see on the right is an image, which is the realization of a Gaussian process, which is has exactly the same second order moment as the turbulence that you have on the right. And obviously, you have some kind of local regularity, but you've lost all the geometry. But the question is how to go beyond. The reflex in both physics and statistical signal processing in the 90s was to say, OK, so let's go to high order moments. But that was essentially a failure. It's a failure, why? Because when you have you are in high dimension and you begin to compute high order moments, then you have a very high variance. In particular, what, any small outliers will create a very large variance on your estimators. And because you can't control this, the, the variance, the models that you are building are worse than second order moments. So essentially, high order moments didn't work in order to build models for uh, such complex processes. So we are back to the question, what kind of other regularity on our probability distribution can we use? And in what sense, how well it relates to deep network in order to, to define such model? OK, if you come back to this idea of regularity, what it is about, it means that if you take x 
we are used, if we translate x a little bit, we are wondering whether the probability distribution is going to move a little bit. But now we can do the same thing, but instead of translating x, taking the action of another group, g over x, and wonder for families of other groups whether the probability distribution of p of x moved by the action of another uh, group operator is going to be regular or not. So what kind of other groups? Well, translation is only a two-dimensional group. You could think of rotations, things like that, but you can also think of much larger groups. What kind of much larger group you can think of? Diffeomorphism. What if you deform x? If you deform x in the case of turbulence, for large classes of deformations, you are going to obtain realizations still of turbulence, which means that you expect that the probability distribution is going to be regular relatively to actions of diffeomorphism. So there are very strong regularities like that. Now, in order to be able to estimate the probability distribution, like in the Markov case, we will need to reduce the number of interactions. One way to do it, even though you are in a situation whether, okay, so here is an example where you have particle. This particle can be in an electromagnetic field. Typically, they will have very far away interactions. But you can think of these points also as agent in a social networks you cannot neglect the influence even of people very far away from you. Let's think of, for example, a Russian somewhere in the Taiga. Can you eliminate his influence from your life? The problem is that if you eliminate him, you are going to eliminate his influence, only his influence. You are going to eliminate all Russians. Why not him and the others? And in fact, Russians can have an influence of your life if, for, for example, there is a political conflict between your country and Russia that may uh, affect the economy. So what does that mean? Typically, you have a very strong interaction with your neighbors, your parents, but you also have interactions which are weaker from larger uh, group of people like your friends and so on, companies. And you still have an interaction with much larger group of people much more far away, like, for example, uh, uh, Russians, if you are not Russian, in this case, they are far away, or French, if you are not French, and so on. This is well known in physics. That's how you can considerably reduce the number of interaction by grouping them. That's multiple <laughs> techniques. And the whole key observation is that to do that, you want to group them in bigger and bigger group. Now, what is very complex when you begin to do these kind of scale separations is that these groups also interact. So the whole problem is to understand with that kind of scale separation approach that we use all the time in science, when you work in physics, you work in quantum physics, you work in geophysics or in cosmology, but usually you don't work across all scales, can we reduce the complexity of the problem? And that's where wavelets will come in, because wavelets are essentially a tool to do scale separations. And what I want to show is that this will be a path to deep network, and that will arrive to a graphical model back, but in a different space. Okay, so what is a wavelet? A wavelet is essentially like a sine wave, but localized, okay? So this is like a cosine, but multiplied by a Gaussian, and it's a complex function, like a complex exponential, I have here the sine. Because it's localized, I'm going to take my function, and that will be the tool to do scale separation, going to scale it by multiple scaling factor, two to the j. So here you see your wavelets with different scales. Okay, real imaginary part. In 2D, like in sine waves, I'm going to rotate the wavelets. So these are all the rotations. And then what I do is I do a convolution of my original image with each of the wavelets. So it's an inner product with the wavelet, which is translated. Now, if you look in the Fourier domain, as you know, a product, a convolution in special domain, is just a product. So that amounts essentially to take the Fourier transform of your function and to project it over the Fourier support of the wavelet, which is very well localized in an analysis like here. When you rotate the wavelet, the Fourier support is going to rotate. So you have different frequency channels. When you dilate the wavelet in space, the Fourier support is going to be shrinked and you're going to get all these channels. 
So basically, the scale separation amounts in taking your image and explode the image in multiple channels at different scale and different rotations. And if you do that, so you have all scales at the end, you are going to have the average of your function. You are going to build a wavelet transform. Okay, and if you cover well your Fourier domain, then you are going to have a conservation of energy. Good, so how does it look like? You have your image, these are the fine scale coefficients and the average from which you are going to compute the next fine scale coefficient. Here I show the amplitude of the coefficients. You can see it's very sparse because the large coefficients are near edges, sharp transitions. And then you continue and you continue. Okay. Now from that, we want to build moments which are going to be invariant to translations. Okay, so you have a function and you want to build an invariant to translation. If you impose that your operator is linear, the only thing that you can do is average. That's the only linear operator which is going to lead to invariants to translation. And if you want to be locally invariant to translation, you are going to make a local averaging with, let's say, a Gaussian. Now, if you want to have something global invariant to translation, you have to completely average. And obviously, you've lost everything. So where is the information you've lost? The information you've lost are in the high frequencies. The high frequency are oscillating functions that I'm going to capture here as wavelet coefficients. Now, this you cannot average it, because if you average it, you are going to get zero. So in order to produce an invariant to translation which is not zero, you need to put a nonlinearity. Simplest nonlinearity you can think is to extract the envelope of this complex function. So this is the envelope of the wavelet coefficient at each of the different scales. Now, if you want to have something invariant to translation, you need to average this. Here is it. You are going to average it by a convolution with an averaging kernel. But obviously, if you do that, you are going to lose information. What information are you losing when you average? You are losing the high frequencies. In other words, you are losing the sharp transition of your envelope. So the idea is that you can get more moments, more uh, moments invariant to translation by extracting these high frequencies again by computing their variations through wavelet coefficients. And again, suppress the phase by calculating an absolute value and averaging. If you do such a process like this, you are essentially arriving to a deep convolutional network. In what sense? You take your x, you separate scales by computing the different wavelet coefficient by a sequence of convolution subsampling, and then you compute the absolute value. Now, this image, if you want to make an invariant, you are going to average it successfully and get all the details that you've lost, which are the wavelet coefficients of this image. Then if you want to get an invariant for each of them, you are going to bring them back and compute the different wavelet coefficient and so on. The idea is essentially the depths of your network corresponds to multi-scale aggregation. And when you arrive at the bottom, you have something which is locally invariant to translation. These are obtained with a cascade of linear operator, convolution with wavelet, nonlinearity, linear, and so on. That's what we call a scattering operator because it scatters the information across all the different channels. Now, if you look at it, what's the difference with a convolutional network? We don't link here all the images at any given layer. So there is no recombinations of the different channels and we'll see what's the effect of that. Okay, before showing example, let's look at the properties of that kind of operator. This kind of operator have been built with wavelets which are isometries. An absolute value is an operator which kills the phase, so it's a contractive operator. So if you take an isometry and you contract, you obtain a contractive operator. All this network was obtained by cascading these nonlinear operators. What you did is essentially apply a sequence of contractive operators. So the resulting operator is going to be contracted. In this domain, in other words, if you look at the output of your network, if you apply a stupid Euclidean norm, all the distances are reduced. The norm 
of the vector at the output will be equal to the norm of the original signal because each operator preserves the norm. But what is really interesting is that you're going to obtain something which is stable to diffeomorphism. And why is that the case? Because the wavelets are local. If you locally deform, they are going to remain very similar to themselves as long as the deformation is small. In other words, in general, if you want to stabilize an operator relatively to diffeomorphism, you don't have the choice. You need to separate scale. This is why it is so important here in that kind of network, which means that if you take your x, you deform it with here a tau of u. A small deformation corresponds to a small modification of spatial distances. This is measured by the sup-norm of the Jacobian of tau, of tau. This is the weak topology of a diffeomorphism. What you can prove is that the output of your network is going to be Lipschitz continuous to the action of diffeomorphism. In other words, in that space of coefficient, the action of a diffeomorphism will look like locally a linear operator. So, I'm going to show first what that kind of thing will do on supervised learning. Diffeomorphism was important because we knew that our probability distribution was stable to diffeomorphism, so you want invariants which are stable. Okay, let's try and apply that kind of invariance. So, you take your random process X, which is stationary, and you apply your output of your deep network, which are all the convolutions with the wavelets cascaded, and I'm going to here to stop at the order two. So only two sequence of uh, convolution, modulus, and average. Now, if the average increases and increases, because x, x convolve with psi, or two convolutions, they are stationary processes, if you have some weak ergodicity property, if you average a stationary process, you expect that it's going to converge to the mean. In other words, the averaging of x, x is stationary, will converge to the expected value. That will converge to the expected value of x convolved with the wavelets, and so on. For this, you'll get that if you are, have some independence from faraway uh, coefficients, like the condition imposed here, but you can have much weaker properties to have that. Okay. Better? Yeah. Okay. So, what you know is that you are going to have coefficients if the depths increase, which are going to converge to your expected value. Now, the problem is you don't want to apply the maximum entropy theorem because you don't want to have to compute all your Lagrange multipliers because you are going to have typically several thousands moments here. So, how can you attack the problem? You know that you have a concentration phenomena. In other words, the scattering transform of your random process is going to converge with a high probability to the expected value. So all typical coefficient of x are going to end up in a small ball around the expected value. Now suppose you take one realization. This realization is going to be very likely close to the expected value. In other words, any realization of x will be very likely to be close to this particular realization up to an error epsilon, so within this ball. So how can you model x? What you can do now is you consider the set of all x in your original space whose scattering transform will end in this ball. In other words, the scattering transform of x will be very close to the scattering transform of your particular realization. It's that set. And now you consider the maximum entropy distribution of a disk set which is bounded. That defines what is called a microcanonical model in statistical physics. In other words, you can view the output of your network as measurement, observable, and then you try to consider the set of all possible configuration that will lead to the same observable up to an error epsilon. And that defines a probability distribution here. This probability distribution may be very far from the one of x if your moments don't constrain enough your model so that you have a much bigger set. In other words, the curlback Leibler distance between p and p hat may be very large. Now, the whole problem 
is that in high dimension, you cannot compute a cool back Leibler distance between any two distributions. So what can you do? What you can do is sample your random process. You can weak, use weaker norm like projection of a particular moment. But what typically people do, and for example with these deep net, is to sample the distribution. Now how can you sample the distribution? If you begin from a Gaussian white noise, then it's like taking a point on the unit sphere of your signal space. And then from that point, when you do a gradient descent, what you hope is that you are going to converge to a point of that set. And what you hope is that the measure induced by the original measure on the unit sphere is going to lead to a near maximum entropy measure on this microcanonical set. OK. What do you know? In that kind of situation, there is one result that you can prove at least is that the microcanonical measure, so the one obtained by inverting with maximum entropy, and the Gibbs measure, which was obtained by maximizing the entropy constrained by the expected value, they are go both going to converge to the same Gibbs measure when d goes to infinity, and that's the result from Hans Otto Georgi using a large deviation principle. However, what you don't know is that the gradient descent will converge to the appropriate microcanonical distribution. That's an open problem. You can try numerically. This is a texture. This is a texture which has been produced by second order moments. So the number of second order moments is equal to the number of pixels. In that case, about 60,000. This is a texture which was obtained with the second order scattering coefficient. And here, the number of moments is only log d squared. So you have 100 less moments than here. But as you can see, you can reproduce the geometry of your problem because you have connected the scale and the angles. That's another example. And that's turbulence. And you can see turbulence. This is the Kolmogorov model. It's better, but very far from perfect. This is an example where deep net were doing very well. It's OK, but it's much worse. That's yet another example, and it's still much worse. OK, so what are we missing? If you look at the problem, as I mentioned, we didn't introduce any connections between the channel. And one issue in this deep net is to understand what's the nature of this connection. Now, in that kind of model, what are the different channels? The different channels correspond to different rotations, different rotations of the wavelet at any given scale. Now, if you have any regularity relatively to rotation, if you want to express this regularity, which in the case of turbulence is true, because typically the distribution is invariant to rotation, what you need is to filter linearize along this rotation channel. So what we need now to do Whatever we've been doing in space, because we were just dealing with translation, we are now going to do it along other group actions, like, for example, here, rotations. If you want to have an invariant, the first thing you need to do is to implement an operator which is covariant to the action of the group, and therefore a convolution. OK, so now instead of just looking at translations, we are looking at the group of translation rotation, rigid movement, in other words, special Euclidean group two. So that means that an element of the group acting on an image is not just translating the image, it's also rotating the image, okay? The group element is given by a translation rotation, but you have to be careful, this is now a non-commutative group. Okay, you take your image. Initially, you only have the translation variable. But the convolution with the wavelet has introduced now a rotation variable. So now you can look at the action of your group over this translation rotation variable. And if you want to have something which is covariant, you are going to implement a convolution on the group. So essentially, we do exactly the same thing that we did in space. But now we have a new orientation, which is rotation. And we now do a convolution in rotation translation. This is a roto-translation convolution. So the wavelet now 
is not just a spatial wavelet, but it has also a rotation component along the theta variable. And you are going to filter the images along space, but also along the channels, which happens here to be the rotation channels. And this is how the, uh, the 3D tensor that I mentioned looks like. And you cascade, and you get your coefficient. So if you do that, now we've done the connection. You can now look at the moments that you obtain. And as you can see, you slightly improve, but we are still not there. We are still not there. The kind of textures that you obtain here, you have about 1,000 moments, so it's still much, much less than deep network, are not quite, don't look like the original one. So what are we missing? The group that we are still missing is now the phase. So what is the phase? When you compute your wavelet transform, you have a modulus, but you have a phase. The phase corresponds to the phase due to the two wavelets, which are symmetrical and antisymmetrical. So what is a phase giving you as an information? The phase groups gives you an information about the local symmetry. When you go from a phase pi to a phase pi over 2, you essentially go from something which is locally symmetric to something which is locally antisymmetric. If you look at a phase image, look at the lines of constant phase. These are the lines of constant phase. Basically, they extract edges. They are like edge detectors. And in fact, zero crossings corresponds to lines of constant phase. That's what people were using. So you want to use the phase. Now, how are you going to use it? Well, like a deep net. You take your x, your image. You filter it with a wavelet, but now you introduce a phase variable in your wavelet. It's always the same idea. If you want to express the regularity relatively to a group, you are going to introduce the group variable within your network, and here it's a phase variable. Now, suppose that you recombine now all the phases by doing a Fourier transform relatively to the phase variable. So the phase variable now is going to have a Fourier coefficient which is the index k. You compute the Fourier transform of this relatively to this var variable. There is a simple result that you can prove. Because your nonlinearity, the ROLU, is homogeneous, so if you take the ROLU of a number a multiplied by beta, it's going to be beta the ROLU of a, with beta is positive. Whenever you compute this Fourier transform, you are not going to change the modulus. The phase is just a translation, is going to appear as the phase to the power k, and the ROLU is just going to be coded by a multiplicative component. In other words, what's happening, you are computing high order moments of the phase. But you don't touch the modulus. Because you don't touch the modulus, you don't have this explosion of high order moments, and you have all your Lipschitz regularity properties that you had before, relatively to translation, relatively to diffeomorphism. So we're going to work with high order moments, but high order moments of the phase, which are essentially calculated with these deep networks. So these were the wavelet coefficients, the modulus, and the phase. And now let's take the exponents, the harmonics of the phase. How does the image look like? This is power 2. The phase accelerates by a factor 2, by a factor 4. Now what do you see? You see that these phases and these phases, they move at the same speed. So what are you introducing? You are now introducing a connection between the different scales. And that's the key point. One of the things that I explained is that you separate scales, but you need to understand how scale interact. And the scale interaction will get it from the phase. So let me summarize the idea. The idea is you take your x, your network explodes the information, different scale, different orientation, different phases, and then computes the connection between them. The connection between the different scales through the phase, the connection between the different orientation the diff through the rotation group, and the connection between the different spatial points with the second order scattering coefficients. You can compute this connection with just correlations, as they did, or with other measurements. We just use here a correlation. What are you having? It's a graphical structure. However, the graph is not built on the spatial grid. The graph is built in this hyperspace when, when you move, you move along different groups. You can have the spatial group, the rotation group, 
and the phase groups. And if you do that, we get all the structure, essentially. These are obtained with 3,000 moments, so again, 100 times less moments that deep network were uh, using, but you obtain now, you recover the same quality of uh, textures. Now, the whole problem is, obviously, you would like to prove that there is some kind of convergence in terms of probability distribution, but again, empirically, it's very hard to do that because you can't estimate these densities or uh, Karunan, uh, sorry, uh, kullback libler distances in high damage. So let me go to the last smaller part here that will be generative uh, networks. All what we did here were on stationary processes. Now, what if you want to model a non-stationary process? You have this spectacular result with this jungle of generators, GAN, autoencoders, recurrent neural net, wave nets, and so on. Can we try to introduce a little bit of mathematics within this? That's what I'll try uh, to do, uh, just a little bit. Okay, so I'll take the variational autoencoder. What's the idea? You begin with X, your random process, and through a variational autoencoder, which is essentially a convolutional network here, you try to build a Z, which is almost a Gaussian white node. And to do that, you try to minimize the uh, kullback libler divergence between the distribution of Z and the distribution of a Gaussian white node. Now, as Aroa observed, essentially this is a completely intractable problem. You cannot compute this kullback libler distance with any uh, good estimator. But let's try. And then you solve an inverse problem, which consists from the phi of x to generate something which is very close to x. Okay, so you essentially have a whitening and an inverse problem, and you do that in a joint optimization, and that's a variational autoencode. Now, the kind of results obtained are quite spectacular, and for example, these are uh, where bedrooms, I think that was obtained with adversarial networks, but same principle, you have your Gaussian white noise input and the synthesis. Now, if one white noise corresponds to, let's say, one bedroom, and another white noise to another bedroom, what you can do is a linear combination from this white noise and do a synthesis from any linear combination. And what is quite remarkable is that this linear interpolation in the embedding space looks like bedroom, as if you had flattened up completely your whatever manifold of bedroom. If you do the same thing on faces, you view that as a video, an interpolation leads to a video where all intermediate images are still faces. Okay, so how can we think this problem in relation with, with what we just did? The first step, we are going to avoid it by imposing prior information. If we have some prior information on X, we may be able to define the phi of X, which is nearly Gaussian. The second step, so if you are able to Gaussianize X, then you can whiten it and obtain a white nose. If you can have an embedding, define a priori, which whitens your problem, then the problem is just an inverse problem. From the Z, try to invert phi, but the specificity of what is done here is that the whitening which is done by a decoder is done by a neural network. So instead of doing a maximum entropy inverse of the embedding, we are doing here an inversion which is regularized by the structure, the architecture of your deep network. So among all deep network, we'll choose the one which best inverts our embedding. So we don't maximize at all anymore the entropy. So what are we going to take for the embedding? Well, all these images are stable by deformations. So we are going to use a scattering transform, which we know how to uh, use. And because the scattering transform is computed with a nonlinear operator and an averaging, with this phi j, when you average a lot, if you have, again, enough ergodicity, you can hope that this is going to converge, thanks to the central limit theorem, to a Gaussian distribution. 
when the scale gets very big. But here, and that's the whole situation, you want your embedding to be invertible on your examples because then you will need to invert your embedding. So you need to choose a Gaussianization scale, which is enough so that it Gaussianizes, but not too much. It doesn't mix too much so that you still have this invertibility property, which you can represent as an inverse Lipschitz bound. So the idea is the following. Begin with X, we're going to do the same thing that we did before, a scattering transform. Just we're going to whiten the scattering transform by computing the covariance and diagonalizing the covariance. And then, instead of doing a maximum entropy reconstruction, the reconstruction is going to be done with a deep network, given that we first invert the linear operator that was whitening the problem. Good. And of course, this is going to be implemented with a deep network. The number of depths of the network is exactly equal to the number of scale that we used in the forward scattering transform. So let's see what kind of results you obtain. Here you have two random processes. One is polygons of different color, different shapes. And these are samples. And this is a uh, databases of celebrities. So what you do is you compute the scattering transform of your training example. And then you train the deep network in order to invert, to recover the original example, which you nearly do of course, because you've optimized your network for that. Then you can try on test example. So you build new examples of polygons that you've never seen, and you try to test whether your network is still able to invert your scattering transform. And you observe on all the examples, the inversion is pretty good. Now, you take a polygon, which corresponds to an input, another polygon, which corresponds to another input, and now you do the linear interpolation of your input. And each time you do the synthesis with your network. And as you can observe, you have these deformations one into the other. This is viewed as a video. And you can see how one shape progressively morph into the other. You can do the same thing with your celebrities. This is what you obtain from the scattering transform of the original face of the other one in the scattering domain you do a linear interpolation, you recover all images which looks like a progressive morphing one image in the other. If you view that as a video, that's what you get. You see how the image progressively morph one into the other, and you can do that for other kind of images. So one reason of that is that you've nearly linearized your diffeomorphism in the scattering domain so that you don't need to learn your embedding. Now, what if you put true white noise in the input. So you put Gaussian white noise, you de-whiten it, and then you use your inverse scattering calculated as a deep net. They don't look like polygons, but they are geometrical shapes. So you can see that now you have a random process which is producing to you geometrical shape of nearly uniform uh, colors calculated by optimizing these deep net, and that's what you get from, true face, from Gaussian white noise. It does synthesize new faces. OK, how can we interpret that? What has been happening? In some sense, your deep net here has been regularizing the inversion. And you can see it by the fact that if you look at the coefficient in the deep net, they have a tendency to be very sparse, as if, in some sense, they had memorized some kind of patterns or dictionaries of the embedding. And this memorization effect, you see it by the fact that now, if you have a much more complex scene, such as bedrooms, the inversion is not as good anymore, even on the training examples. And if you look reconstruction from white noise, it considerably degrades. That kind of behavior, you see it in the same way in all variational autoencoder. So it's as if this regularized inversion had some kind of memory capacity, which is a totally different framework, obviously, from 
the maximum entropy inversion. Now, what's interesting is that you have these other families of generators, which are the generative adversarial networks, which works differently. The way they work is you have one network which do the synthesis, and the other network which evaluates whether the synthesis looks or has the quality of the original image. There, you will see you have remarkable quality of all your synthesis. And that's a result that was obtained by a team at NVIDIA. All these images are faces that were not in the original database that they've synthesized from white noise. And they look outstanding. So, a priori, one could think, okay, so I have a totally amazing and fantastic tool to model random processes. However, they forget. What I mean is that there is a trade-off. Either you represent all your images, but then you have to degrade the quality, or within your database, you essentially forget some of the images. That's called a dropping mode. And in the previous images, how can you find out that they forget images? In this database of um, bedrooms, in some of the bedrooms, there are people who are there. In all the synthesis of generative adversarial network, there is no people, which means that somewhere they don't take into account the whole entropy of the process. So it's more like a graphical, remarkable graphical synthesis process than truly as a random process that incorporates the whole diversity and which is able to cope with the whole entropy of the random processes. But still, it's very interesting. It's very interesting conceptually because you have suddenly memory that comes into the game of these uh, inversion and reconstructions. Okay, let me conclude on that. So the conclusions is of different form. The first thing is we have these amazing tools in graphical models, marker random fields, which are really the basis of statistical physics. But most of the case, they are applied on the original domain. And the claim here is that if you begin to include the regularities of a much more complex group, and then you build essentially a harmonic analysis machines which builds the network, you get something which is very close to a deep network. And you can still have a graphical model which now works because the correlations are local, and which includes the long-range interaction that you cannot include if you apply your graphical model on the original spatial grid. That kind of model is able at least to reproduce random processes which have behaviors like turbulence and a very large classes of other processes. So that, I believe, is an opening that Deep Network currently is doing over uh, mathematics for modeling random processes. Now, for non-ergodic process, I think also that these generators are opening very interesting questions. What we absolutely don't understand right now is really the nature of the regularization which is produced by these generators. However, what I think is that, and what is in some sense demonstrated by these examples, in that in this optimization of the two networks, one can be dropped. You essentially have enough prior information to define the original embedding so that the whole problem is essentially an inverse problem. And the whole issue is then understanding the nature of the regularization that is imposed on the inverse problem by the architecture of the deep net that you impose in your problem. So I'll be finishing on that. Thanks. One hour is too long. So when you were talking about the microcanonical uh, models, you mentioned the fear of the problem, which was if you stop. But I think I'm the only one with a microphone, so anyway. Um,
So uh, you mentioned that if you start from a random point on a sphere and then you run gradient descent, you wanted to say you converge to the max entropy distribution. But what I don't get is why, why couldn't there be holes in the set of you know, models with similar observables? And then you cannot attain them. I think there can be holes. Uh, we are, that problem is exactly the same kind of problem than the one which says uh, when you do a gradient descent over your uh, uh, supervised problem, how come you are uh, going so deep and able to reach a local minima, which is not so bad? Uh, it's essentially the same kind of problem. Uh, why the local minima have a direction of descent, still many of them at least, which are very high. I don't know. It's, exact, it's the equivalent problem in an unsupervised uh, framework. So you would reach something good, but it wouldn't be the, the max entropy so. distribution? I think so. I think so. I doubt that we are reaching to the exact uh, okay. uh, maximum entropy distribution. And, but these are very effective algorithms that people are using. And yeah, that's a way to state the, the, conge the, the, the question. Okay, if there is no more question, let's thank uh, Stefan again. Thanks. And we start again at...